What is up, gang? Thank you for checking out Sledgehammer TV tonight. Another lifeless, uninspired, completely meaningless episode of Monday Night Raw on what's supposed to be the road to WrestleMania, but it certainly doesn't feel like it. They gave us a show tonight that meant absolutely nothing. Imagine having seven days to come up with an idea for your television show and coming up with absolutely nothing. Nothing. We are going to talk about all of that and so much more right here and right now. My name is Nick Nightmare. You are watching the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show's Monday Night Raw Review and Reaction Show. Let's do it. We all know that Raw is a terrible wrestling program, but it's not always this bad. This is one of those nights where you just regret being a fan of the WWE. You know, you would think that as a company, they would see that the world is collectively laughing at the competition after what happened at Revolution last night. I was laughing at them, and now tonight, I'm laughing at myself. I'm laughing at myself because I'm an idiot for being a fan of world wrestling entertainment. Do they not realize that WrestleMania is like five weeks away? They got this unnecessary speed bump of a pay-per-view known as Fastlane right in the way, and you know, they're directing all their, you would think they would be at least directing their attention to that, but tonight on Raw, they're not pushing anything towards that more than maybe what Drew and Sheamus might be doing, but no, they're, they're making championship matchups for next Monday, for the go-home show. Shouldn't they be putting title matches like the Raw Tag Team Championship match they made tonight and the United States Championship matchup as well on the pay-per-view that's coming up in just a little over a week instead of putting it on Monday Night Raw? After what you made me sit through tonight, there is no way I would care about anything for Monday Night Raw next week at all. Outside of maybe a return of somebody that means something somebody like a Brock Lesnar or a CM Punk back to WWE, then, then I'll be watching and I'll be excited. Other than that, we have nothing to be excited for, and there is no reason to believe either one of those gentlemen are showing up on Raw. So it's just the same old shit every week. This show specifically was almost identical to last week's show, and last week's show was no picnic, and this was like having a picnic where everybody that came to the picnic brought you big gigantic plates of garbage and dog shit to ingest because that's what we had here tonight. The only thing, the only thing on tonight's episode of Raw that was worth seeing was watching Bobby Lashley come out with his new little tweaked entrance. They gave him lightning bolts and he's got like this whole new Titan Tron package and he comes out looking like a Greek god. The Almighty Era has begun. I would have called it the Age of the Almighty, but that's just me. I'm always better at it than they are. But he looked fucking great. He looked like a champion. And you know one of the things I like about Bobby Lashley as champion? He's a scary. He's a scary, scary brother, man. He don't need no fiend mask. He don't need to be seven feet tall. When you look in the eyes of this version of Bobby Lashley, he is a terrifying human being, and that is the type of person you want as your world champion, much like a Brock Lesnar. You look at Brock Lesnar, you're immediately going to be terrified of this man. Bobby Lashley's got that same thing with him tonight. MVP coming out dressed to the nines reminded me of the Doctor of Style Slick. Reborn in Montel Vontavious Porter tonight. I think the whole package is great, and I... I could not wait for him to just defeat The Miz and get this over with. There was no reason for The Miz to have a rematch tonight. Isn't this the same company that says automatic championship rematches will no longer be granted? But here we are, just seven days out. The Miz is given a rematch, and it was way too long. 
It was not just the Miz's opening promo where he explained how he's getting a rematch and he deserves this, and the WWE undoubtedly sees that this was the right thing to do. He recapped everything that they showed at the beginning of the show already, but he gets his match. Bobby Lashley comes out, and every single second that went by was one second too long for my liking. I thought they were going to pull some bullshit some sort of shenanigans, and I'm glad that I was wrong. But every single minute that passed that made this match go longer, I thought somehow they were going to screw this up. Thankfully, like I said, I was wrong. Drew McIntyre stayed in the back, awkwardly watching the TV sideways, as everybody in the WWE has to do. And this was kind of just to set up the fact that Drew McIntyre is practically the only one on the entire roster that's being considered for Bobby Lashley right now. And this would lead to a post-match thing with Sheamus. Because Bobby Lashley, as we said, thankfully defeated The Miz. That's all said and done. He looked like a beast doing it. He had The Miz tap out to the Hurt Lock. That's it. And then in the back, Sheamus attacks Drew McIntyre while he's talking to the... Uh, random promo bot in the back and he's trying to stake his claim for his match at WrestleMania. He liked to throw the fact that he beat Brock Lesnar out there. So now he threw Brock's name into the universe. And I know I'm not the only one hoping that Brock comes back and becomes part of this matchup because Drew versus Bobby at WrestleMania really doesn't scream main event to me. And I know that seems kind of crazy because Drew's the former champion. He won last year at WrestleMania, beating Brock Lesnar, I know. But there's just something about it that doesn't seem intriguing. But if you throw Brock Lesnar into the mix, I'm definitely more excited to see what that match could bring about. Just the impending clash between Bobby and Brock is really, I think, all a lot of us are salivating for. And I would be very welcoming of that. One of Raw's biggest problems is the fact that it is a show full of heels like everybody's a bad guy there are no good guys i mean everybody who's intertwined in some sort of feud is evil like the fiend and randy orton they're both bad guys aj and randy orton fought tonight they're both bad guys you got the hurt business who are kind of heels i think but they're more like tweeners because everybody likes them now and they've been involved with retribution that are heels and there's just there's too many there's too many, so it's hard to get invested. It's hard to know who to root for, especially when they're giving us this bullshit with a Braun Strowman and Shane McMahon. Oh my God, you want to talk about one of the worst segments, maybe the very worst segment in Raw history. It happened tonight on this show. It's bad enough that they're planning Braun and Shane at WrestleMania, and you don't want to see it, I don't want to see it, but let's make no mistake about it. Tonight's episode featured a segment for these two men. They were out there twice, right? So the first time, Braun Strowman comes out, and he's pissed at Shane for what he did last week in the World Tag Team Championship match, which we're all glad about because nobody wanted to see Braun Strowman and Adam Pearce become the World Tag Team Champions, but it really didn't make sense. It was kind of stupid, and that would set the tone for everything that would come tonight. Shane McMahon approaches Braun because Braun wants an apology. And Braun gets his apology. Shane McMahon sweats his way out, dropping buckets of sweat, beating off the top of his forehead all the way down the ramp, does his little here come the money thing, and gets in Braun Strowman's face, apologizes, apologize, Jesse Jackson style, and then leaves. And Byron Saxon's like, what, that's it? And I'm sitting there and I'm like, what, that's it? Who gives a shit about this as it is? You're definitely not making it interesting, but they definitely decided to make things worse because they would come back out. Shane McMahon says he's got something more to say to Braun Strowman. He said it. He said, I got something more to say. So they went out there. And then Shane McMahon said nothing. Shane McMahon breathed into the microphone with his nose. He kept repeating like the same four words. Oh, uh, there are other people. You could... And he was just stumbling and fumbling and sweating all over the place. 
maybe the sweat was dripping into his mouth and he couldn't find a way to get his lips to get in tune with his brain. I don't know what it is. Maybe he sweated out all his brain cells. Maybe I thought that the only reason the first segment went so short is I said, no, maybe Shane forgot the script. So he apologized for Braun, which might have been legitimate because, hey, I'm sorry, I apologize. I forgot what I was supposed to come out here to do. So then he goes back, he wipes himself down with his sweat towel, he studies the script over the course of the next hour, and then comes out there and forgets all of his lines. I need to believe that that's what happened. Because if that's not what happened, then they actually wrote somebody in the back, actually penned down on a piece of paper all of the things that transpired in this segment making Shane McMahon look like a bumbling idiot. And I can't, I can't process the fact that that's the way it was supposed to go down. If that was the game plan, it was the stupidest thing ever. If he was supposed to be out there trying to frustrate Braun Strowman, why is showing yourself to be incompetent and stupid the way to frustrate somebody else? And Braun's like, oh, you want to waste my time? Brr, Braun! And then he starts chasing Shane McMahon. Shane McMahon pretends to leave. Braun gives chase, sees Shane's car peeling out of the arena, and then doubles back and walks away. And then Shane McMahon comes back again. And he's waving. He's waving. You know who he's waving to? He's waving to all the people that just changed the fucking channel because he wasted 20 minutes of our time huffing and puffing into the microphone saying absolutely nothing. Nothing. And just insinuating that somehow this whole feud is because Shane thinks Braun is stupid. And you know how I know this? Because after Shane waved to all of the fans changing channels and, and waved to his interest in everything because he seemed like he was phoning in everything and he didn't even really care, he turns to the camera and says the word stupid. Stupid. Now, yes, you're correct, Shane. This whole entire thing that you did was fucking stupid. And if you just wasted all of my time to call Braun Strowman stupid as a basis for them facing off at WrestleMania, am I five? Calling somebody stupid is supposed to generate feelings of shock and awe in me. The fa I'm supposed to want to get by. Who are we supposed to be getting behind here anyway? Isn't Braun Strowman a heel? Isn't Shane McMahon the heel boss? They got the nerve to play in the, the audio Shane O'Mac chants. If there was an actual crowd there, they definitely wouldn't be cheering. And they wouldn't be celebrating his arrival with Shane O'Mac chants. They'd be blocking themselves with their towels, making sure they don't get covered in his sweat drops. And they'd be booing their asses off. Because I think Shane fancies himself almost as if he's the new Undertaker. Well, I have to have my match at WrestleMania, where I can go be the stuntman that I am, Sweat Stain McStuntman, WrestleMania Highlight Reel, against Braun Strowman, two heaping piles of trash thrown into an unnecessary match with a story that is equally as garbage as both of its competitors. I could care less. And all you did tonight was make it even worse. It was the worst thing I have ever had to sit through on Monday Night Raw, and it was odd, and it was uncomfortable, and I don't know what happened. It really seemed as if Shane McMahon's brain fizzled the fuck out, and he forgot everything that he was supposed to say. And I'm going to go with that. That's what we're sticking with here. I'm going to believe that that's the case. I don't care what they say tomorrow. I don't care if they try to make... You know, sense of it. Oh, no, Shane was playing with Braun. He was... No, 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 no. No. Shane McMahon fucked up and forgot his lines. And that's why that was such an abysmal segment. I will not believe that they paid an employee to write that shit. And then Vince McMahon thinking it's a good idea? I mean, I guess I could believe that in retrospect. Because he's the same fucking guy that pays some idiot on the roster to write a story for Matt Riddle where the best thing he could come up with is let's dress him up like Evil Knievel and give him a fucking scooter because, you know, he's a, a teenage stoner boy. He's a gigantic man-child. 
who doesn't know shit and acts really immature and dumb and walks around in flip-flops and wrestles in bare feet and nothing more to him than that. Nothing about his MMA history, nothing about his training, his upbringing, what makes Matt Riddle Matt Riddle. No, we're going to make him fucking Opie. He's Opie, little Opie Dopey, and he don't know shit. And we're going to dress him up in a stupid costume, and you're going to love it. You're going to love it. The only good costumes on tonight's Monday Night Raw was uh, property of Xavier Woods and Kofi Kingston. These guys came out dressed up like Scorpion and Sub-Zero from Mortal Kombat. That kind of shit you can get behind. Dressing him up like Evil Knievel, a guy that half of you guys listening to me right now probably don't even know who I'm fucking talking about. Go look up Evil Knievel. You're going to see the same fucking outfit that you've seen on Matt Riddle tonight. And don't have it be lost on you, the fact that Evil Knievel was a motorcycle stuntman. So not only did they dress him up like him, they gave him a scooter as his motorcycle. All he was missing was the cape. And why stop? Why stop at that point? If you're going to make him look like a fucking jackass, give him the cape too. Go all in. What an abysmal episode this was. And you know they're terrible with their decision making when you see one glaring thing that I don't think many people are going to realize. That Damian Priest wasn't on the show tonight. You couldn't write something for Damian Priest. You couldn't give him a match against somebody. Why? Because Bad Bunny wasn't there? You see how this man has become detrimental? One day, this guy's probably got some sort of other commitment and he can't make it to Monday Night Raw tonight, so fuck Damian Priest. We don't need to keep his push going. We need the man with the, with the giant hair buns in his head. The 24-7, hey, I don't give a shit about it anymore championship. Without that, Damian Priest, we don't need you. Why couldn't he have had a singles match? Why did we have to see the same friggin' matches we see over and over and over again for everybody else? And you couldn't have found time for Damian Priest. But you had more than enough time to go back to recap after recap of last week. They didn't even know what to do for the 1030 to 1045 spot. So they replayed the beginning of the show. Where they replayed Bobby Lashley's whole entrance because I guess they realized that was the most awesome thing we did tonight. So let's show it again. And they filled the show. It was just filler with the entire story of the first match. They showed little clips and pieces of him beating The Miz and getting rid of that monkey off his back right before the AJ Styles-Randy Orton match, which main evented this show was a very uneventful affair, ended with Alexa Bliss on the Titan Tron and Randy Orton spitting up black goo. And this time he spit up just enough black goo to turn around and get hit with a phenomenal forearm, bang, and get beaten by AJ Styles on Monday Night Raw. In a match that means nothing, in a match that we've seen at WrestleMania, this match, it seemed like neither one of them either even wanted to be in this match. It was just a boring, by-the-numbers, Randy Orton-style matchup. Nothing at all of interest happened on this show. If you missed it, you missed absolutely nothing, and you're having a better night than me because you didn't have to see the debacle that was Shane McMahon tonight. It was so bad, there were some fans on Twitter worried that Shane McMahon was having a stroke on live TV. What does that tell you? About the man's performance. Holy shit. <laughs> Let's talk about the matches from top to bottom once again. Bobby Lashley defeated The Miz to retain the WWE Championship. We had that ridiculous Braun and Shane segment. we seen Drew McIntyre and Sheamus have a no disqualification match following Sheamus's attack earlier in the show. There was no need for this matchup. we just seen a very similar match between them last week. Sure, it wasn't a no-DQ match, but it was a very intense, hard-hitting match. It was very good. 
as far as match quality is concerned, but the finish leaves a lot to be desired. You have a no disqualification match that ended in a referee stoppage at nearly 20 minutes because of a dueling chair shot. I'm sorry, dueling steps shot, which is something I don't think any of us has ever seen before. But it also looked like something out of a cartoon where, you know, like two idiot characters will be running around with garbage cans on their head and they end up colliding together. Something out of like a Tom and Jerry cartoon, which that fucking movie is terrible, by the way. Don't watch the Tom and Jerry movie. It's fucking awful. All right. Now, but that's what I felt like I was watching at the end of this. I'm, I'm not going to sit here and tell you I believe that Seamus really got hurt, but I will say that I would not be surprised if we find out tomorrow or at some point that that shot really rung Seamus's bell. Because when you looked back on the replay, he did really crack his head into that thing. The steps also fell on top of him, onto his chest area. Maybe it didn't knock him out, but it certainly might have hurt him in some way. Those steps are fucking heavy. Don't let the fact that they picked them up and, and throw them around fool you. Those are professional wrestlers. They pick up human beings, which are 300 pounds or more. Those steps are a solid maybe 50 to 75 pounds of steel, which coming down from six feet or more is going to hurt you some way. So I wouldn't be surprised if the end of this match kind of was necessitated by a real situation. And much like with Shane McMahon, I kind of hope that that's what happened, not because I want Seamus to be injured, which certainly is not the case, because I love Seamus, but I don't want to think that that's how they would write the end of the match. How would you make that the finish? This is a no disqualification match. You're going to just have it end with a referee stoppage? That's a cheesy way out. That's a cheap way out. And just a way to further this feud between both of these men, which should be coming to a head at the Fastlane pay-per-view. I'm sure they're going to put those pieces in play next Monday on Monday Night Raw. But then again, I'm not sure of anything when it comes to Monday Night Raw anymore. They replayed everything we seen last week with Randy Orton and Alexa Bliss, and then we got to the back and we got introduced to Kevin Patrick! Kevin Patrick, the new promo bot in the back, only this time he's a male. We haven't had a male interviewer in the back in God, I, I don't even really remember since maybe Josh Matthews or, you know, when Tom Phillips was back there. I, I don't know, but it, it was it was different because it's not what we were used to. It wasn't one of the girls that we're always accustomed to seeing, but he did kind of remind me of a cross between Bert and Guy Smiley. So I don't know exactly how I feel about him just yet. He didn't make any mistakes. So, so far, so good. Good luck to you, Kevin Patrick. Beware of the hammer, my friend. He was interviewing AJ Styles in the back. This is how we get to the AJ Orton match. You want to know the, the blockbuster, innovative way they came up with AJ being confronted by Randy Orton? AJ Styles wants to talk about what's happening with Randy Orton. He's intrigued, I guess. But Honestly, he finds it laughable. He thinks it's a joke. He thinks it's funny. So Randy Orton comes into play, and he's pretty much Joe Pesci from Goodfellas. And he's like, oh, you think I'm funny? What are you trying to say? You're trying to say I'm funny over here? And AJ's like, no, you're not funny. I don't think it's funny. I think you're weak. And then Randy's like, oh, well, why don't you come out to the ring with me tonight and I'll show you how weak I am, all right, bro? Well, he didn't really go into Joe Pesci voice, but you you get the picture. It, it was it was lame. It was a lame excuse for these two guys to fight. Who gives a shit? This is more of that fifth grade intellect of Vince McMahon. Oh, he's making fun of me. He thinks my craziness is, is funny and amusing. Am I a clown to you? Stupid way to set up this match, but that's what it was. Orton's going to get his hands on AJ Styles because he made light of the fact that Randy Orton's a crazy bastard. 
and the fiend is messing with his head. Who thinks of this? Certainly not me. They moved the New Day from fighting Retribution to fighting the Hurt Business because there are no tag teams. And, you know, if you want to have a tag team title match, you have to at least get the tag team. So the resident tag team of the New Day, the only real tag team left, I think, in the entire company, gets the... A one-on-one match. It's Xavier Woods versus Shelton Benjamin. How this translates into them getting a tag team title match, I I don't understand that frame of mind. But this was a very quick matchup that didn't really go anywhere. Shelton Benjamin shouldn't be losing. The Hurt Business right now shouldn't be losing. This is all unnecessary, and it was all to build towards a match. Not for Fastlane. Not a title match for Fastlane, but a title match for next Monday, which is a double, double negative. Okay, it's just, you're you're not following the set pattern of professional wrestling, and you shouldn't be wasting title matches on TV, especially so close to a fucking pay-per-view. United States champion, Evil Knievel Riddle, defeated Slapjack, who cares? Who cares? For some reason, Ali is getting a United States Championship match out of this. I guess because he's the only one that actually beat somebody in retribution over the course of the last couple of weeks. They've been relegated back to jobbers. There was no other members of retribution out there tonight, which I thought was odd. It was just Ali and Slapjack. And when Slapjack got his ass kicked... Mustafa Ali thought it would be funny to continue to berate and belittle his followers, and he admonished him after the attack, and it was just all boring from there. Then came the second half of the Shane McMahon-Braun Strowman segment. Shane McMahon started this thing. When Braun entered the ring, he acted like his microphone wasn't working. And all he was doing was stalling for time, breathing into the microphone, fumbling on lines, saying half sentences and fragmented words, and it made no sense. Just as Braun was starting to get mad, he kind of did this thing where he was like, Braun, and kind of made fun of him, and that pissed off Braun, so he chased off after him, which led to him seeing the SUV drive out of the arena, which led to Shane McMahon coming back and waving goodbye to all of our wrestling fan hopes and dreams that this shit will just go away because it's really not going anywhere. This really, really sucked. And if anything ever deserved... (laughs) Thanks, Vince. No, not a thanks, Vince. Fuck Vince. I was going to click the poop hammer button and I hit the thanks, Vince, but I guess we could say thanks, Vince. Because you're an idiot, and and that was awful. And thank you in a sarcastic way. Obviously, it's the only way we need it. But all we wanted to do, and we're gonna do it again the right way, is drop this fucking segment with the poop hammer. <laughs> oh my god, what a big, gigantic turd this was. Then for some reason, we go from this shit segment back to Nia Jax's hole. We actually didn't have to see it for a week, I think maybe two, but it made its return because it's the only thing relevant or maybe they want to, you know, get social media buzzing again because, hey, remember? Remember this? that happened? Remember when this happened and you thought it was funny? Think it's funny again, please. We need the likes and the clicks and the Twitter acknowledgement. Follow me on Twitter. I need the Twitter acknowledgement right here at Nick Nightman. <laughs> Cheap plug. Nia Jackson's Shayna Baszler showed up and they brought even more trash with them. If you thought it was bad enough that they were still the world tag team champions of the women's division, now they got Reginald. They got our false. Don't they know that our truth is already on the Raw roster? They need to bring our false down here to Monday Night Raw. So he's either now been traded, I guess, or he's breaking the brand separation rule just because Nia Jax thinks he's cute. Nia Jax took advantage of him being fired by Carmella and slapped by Sasha, and now she's obviously using him 
Or maybe she legit thinks that a man she can carry on her back like a bag of laundry is cute. I don't know. You know what wasn't cute? Watching this match. Terrible. Nia Jax is as sloppy and dangerous as ever. I thought she was going to murder Carmella. I'm sorry, murder Lana by accident. Shows you how interchangeable these girls are. Not that there's much difference between Lana and Carmella. They're both about the same level, at least in my assessment. But Baszler and Jax retain in a completely unnecessary match. Although they did earn this match, they did not pay it off very well. It was not done in a good way for anybody to get over. Naomi and Lana look like losers. Jax and Baszler continue to just kind of be a, a walking punchline in the, my hole. And now you threw Reginald in there. Absolutely wasting our time and the time of these girls. We went back to Randy Orton because, you know, we actually have to continue telling these or attempting to tell these stories. He talks about, or he was told, rather, by Sarah Schreiber in the back that, you know, oh, many of the WWE locker room is concerned about your state of mind and your mental health. And my immediate thought was the same thought that Randy came back with as an answer. He's like, oh, all of a sudden, I'm surprised to hear I have so many friends in the fucking locker room. He thought it was funny. I thought it was funny because I, last time I checked, this was the Viper punk kicking people, sending everybody to AEW that he touches. And now he's got friends. Where are these friends? Where have these fucking friends been? Where are all these concerned people for Randy Orton as he's been being terrorized by the fiend and scary little witch bliss? Who? Oh, just show me one fucking person. Not fucking one. Ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Says AJ Styles needs to worry about him. Be worried about getting an RKO. Great. Great. Then, just as you thought we were safe because we were coming towards the end of the show and maybe we weren't going to be subjected to some form of Charlotte Flair outside of the advertisement for her appearance on Stone Cold's talk show tonight or whatever, the Broken Skull... Not the Broken Skull. He's got some other fucking straight-up Steve Austin show on USA. Charlotte was the guest. I thought that was all we were going to see of her, but I was not that lucky. She showed up tonight on Monday Night Raw effectively to tell the rest of the girls that she wants Asuka's championship. She's in the back with Mandy Rose and Dana Botch, and apparently they want a shot at Asuka as well, and I'm not sure exactly what they're doing here. And Charlotte says they got five weeks to prove their case. Charlotte says you got five weeks before WrestleMania. You better go out and take care of business. Why? Do they got to impress you? Do, or do they have to beat Charlotte? Is she like the gatekeeper to Asuka? Like, I don't understand what this means. It was unnecessary. It was confusing. And the last thing we need is more Charlotte. But Mandy Rose and Dana Brooke made it very clear that maybe they don't want to be a tag team anymore and they want to focus on their career as individual talents. Good luck with that. Especially with Rhea Ripley coming around who's going to be probably just fed to Charlotte in the end. Anyway. AJ Styles came out for the main event and that's when they decided to replay the entire beginning of the show. Which means AJ Styles was standing in the ring that whole time, which elapsed about at least, I would say, 10 minutes. Why they didn't do the replay first and then start the match, like, I don't know why they do that. They constantly have talent come out there and then they'll go to a backstage segment or to a promo or to a thing where you're, you got it backwards. You're doing it in reverse. The show ended with AJ Styles defeating Randy Orton as we touched upon already. Earlier, all because Alexa Bliss popped up on the Titantron, played her little jack-in-the-box, lit a match, blew it out, 
and then Randy Orton started to heave the black goo once again and got hit by AJ Styles with the phenomenal forearm. Monday Night Raw goes off the air with Alexa Bliss giggling at a very confused Randy Orton. He wasn't the only one that ended Monday Night Raw with a sad, confused look on his face because the rest of us did as well. This was a god-awful episode. I barely made it through, but I'm glad that I did so I can come here and sit and vent and talk with my favorite people on the planet, the Sledgeheads of Sledge Nation, and that's each and every one of you guys. Thank you all so very much. This road to WrestleMania has been a tough one, but we're going to keep traveling down it, and I hope you keep on traveling with us to make sure you don't miss anything along this crazy winding road and to watch the hammer come down on everything in the process all you got to do is hit that subscribe button right now make sure you ring the bell to stay notified and then hit the like button that really helps a whole lot more than you guys can imagine to get us out there we are trying to eclipse that 3,000 subscriber mark this year and then on to 10 100 and beyond that's the mission you all can help us reach it just hit that like button and share this video with somebody that you think will enjoy what we do here, which is actually get some entertainment. We take the hard look at the product. We tell you what we think is wrong with it, and we want to know whether or not you guys agree. So after you share this video, after you like this video, then you can put your comments in the comment section below. Let me know what you thought about tonight's show. Let me know what you think about my thoughts of tonight's show. And as always, Thank you for your continued love and support of Sledgehammer TV and the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show. If you missed anything else over the course of the last couple of weeks, the Royal Rumble review, the review of the Elimination Chamber, Friday SmackDown review, it's all here. It's all here for you, and it'll be linked in the annotations up above. My name is Nick Nightmare. This is the team, Thor the Sledgehammer, the official Sledgehammer of the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show, his tag team partner, the World Heavyweight Champion of all the microphones in all the world, Mr. Blue the Snowball, the most important member of the team, as always, each and every one of you. Thank you all once again. That, my friends, is going to do it. We are out of here, and we will see you next time right here on your new favorite wrestling show, the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show, only on Sledgehammer TV, right here on YouTube.com. Thank <laughs> you.